Okay, this is our last set of video notes for our first unit. Um, this is going to lead us into our project on weather forecasting. Um, so we're going to put everything together about what we already know and the new stuff. The first thing we want to talk about um, is our pressure systems. Again, this is our high pressure system. You can see that here our air is moving downwards and in a um, clockwise motion. So it's moving clockwise like this around and around and around and down you can see that there's no clouds up here so high pressure systems are associated with good weather um, again that air is moving down because it's colder it's more dense okay if you look at this one our air is moving upwards in a counterclockwise direction and as it's moving up you can see all these clouds right there so low pressure systems are going to bring us our bad weather so high pressure good weather low pressure bad weather Okay, and this just again is what I was just talking about um, with your high pressure good weather, low pressure bad weather as that warm air is pushed up, that air is going to cool down when it reaches its dew point, it's going to um, condense and form those clouds. Okay, next, fronts. Let's give it a second to catch up here. Okay. All right, so with fronts, we know, um, you guys learned these symbols. We're going to talk first about a cold front here. Um, the symbols on a cold front point in the direction that the front is moving. So this front is moving this way. It's called a cold front because the colder temperatures are behind it, and it is meeting up with a warm front, which is in front of it. Okay, so it's a cold front. A warm front, again, the symbols are pointing the direction in which it is moving. This is the warm front. It's called the front because it comes in front of the air mass. The warmer temperatures are behind the front, and it's meeting up with a cold air mass in front of it, so your colder temperatures are in front. Okay. The third one is your stationary front. Again, um, you have cold air over here because our cold front is moving this way. You have warm air over here because our warm front is moving that way, but they're stuck. Okay. In this case, your cold air isn't pushing your warm air up. Your warm air isn't going over top of the cold air. They're just stuck there. And stationary means to stay still, means to not move. So these two fronts right here are going to stay still. They're bringing us precipitation for a couple days. Um, and it's pretty miserable because it's just going to be bad weather, dreary weather for a couple days until one of those fronts um, can overtake the other one. The last type is called an occluded front. And you can see that there's a cold air mass moving this way. There was a warm air mass right here, but this air mass pushed it up, and it met up with this other cold air mass. So this warm air mass is sandwiched in between um, of these two cold air masses, and it's cut off from the ground. See right, right here where it says surface occlusion? Um, that means that this warm air mass right here is cut off from the ground, and that's why it's called occluded. Okay, this is everything that I was just talking about. You might need some of this information for your, your guided notes, um, but I think I already reviewed all of it. Moving on to air masses. Um, we talked about these all these different kinds. We'll start with, um, whoops, I didn't put it in drawing mode. Let's go back. Okay, here we go. Um, this is maritime polar. Again, look at where it's forming, near the poles. Okay, It's way up in northern America, and it's forming over the water. So maritime polar means wet and cold. Okay, Here's another one over here. The next one is called a continental polar. You see, it's forming over the land, i.e. continental, continent, land. Okay, So it's not going to be wet. It's going to be dry because it's forming over land. And polar again because it's forming near the poles. Okay, so continental polar is um, dry and cold. And then we get down here, we have maritime tropical here and here. You can see that they're both forming over the water. And guess what is down here is the equator. So tropical because it's nice and warm. So maritime tropical means wet and warm. And then the last type we have right here is continental tropical. Again, it's near the equator, so it's nice and warm, but it's forming over the land, so it is dry. So continental tropical means dry and warm. Now, there's two other things that we need to talk about real quick, which is um, hurricane formation. Um, our hurricanes are going to form in these maritime tropical air masses right here. 
okay? Our hurricanes and our tropical storms are forming there. That's where they're getting their energy from, all that water vapor that they can hold. Remember, warm air holds more water vapor than cold air. So hurricanes and tropical storms are forming in those maritime tropical air masses. Then we have these two, this continental polar air mass and these maritime tropical air masses. And they're going to come up this way. And this guy's coming down. And guess what we have happening here? Right in this area right here. Whoops. Okay. In this area right here from Texas and up is called Tornado Alley. Okay. It's called Tornado Alley because that is where these air masses are meeting most often. These two types, continental, polar, and maritime, tropical. When those two air masses meet, we get a low pressure system. We get a, um, a cyclone of swirling air, low pressure, and then we have just the perfect conditions for a tornado to form. Okay, again, here is all of the wording that goes with everything that I just said. All right, clouds. Here we go. All right, we talked about lots of different types. Um, we'll start at the top and we'll work our way down. Cirrus, those are made of ice crystals. They're one of the main types. They are the highest in the sky. You can see it there at the highest altitude over here. Um, then you have the next main type down here, cumulus, which is white puffy clouds that look like cotton balls. And then you have stratus clouds. And you can see that these are layers. Okay, They are like blankets and they blanket the sky. So most of the time when you see an overcast day, those are stratus clouds. Then we have some other things that have these root words like nimbus, and I think that I drew over the other one, I sure did. There it is, nimbo and nimbus. There's nimbo and nimbus. Both those, nimbo or nimbus, whether it comes at the beginning or the end, mean rain, okay? They are rain producing. So these nimbostratus clouds right here, um, that's a day where you just have like kind of continuous rain all day. It's, it's drizzling, it's light rain. Um, or it's just a steady rain for a long period of time that's coming from the nimbo stratus clouds. Again, your entire sky is overcast with these. These cumulonimbus clouds, also known as thunderheads, okay? They develop when you have mostly a cold front. So the cold front comes in, it pushes warm air upwards in a strong updraft. That's why they're so tall because that warm air is getting pushed straight up. As it's going up, guess what? Here's where your temperature starts to reach its dew point because that's where we start having condensation and cloud formation begin. But because of those strong updrafts, it is pushing this cloud way, way, way high up into the sky. And again, they're called um, cumulonimbus clouds are known as thunder clouds. Um, you have this other root word right here, the alto. So you see alto, alto. Alto means high. So stratus clouds normally form low in the sky. Um, but when they're alto stratus or alto cumulus, um, it means that they have properties of stratus and cumulus clouds, but they are higher in the sky than they they normally are. Okay? All right. There's some of that wording that goes with everything that I just said. Let my computer catch up with what I'm talking about. Here it comes. You're stuck. Hang on one second, we're having some technical difficulties. Okay, there's our clouds. Let's see if we can get to the next slide. There's our cloud. There's all the wording of everything that I was just talking about. Then we're going to move on to this week's topics. Um, this is Objective 23. I can describe different tools used to collect weather data. We are going to first talk about barometers. Um, a barometer is used to measure um, air pressure, atmospheric pressure. And when we measure that, we measure those in millibars. Oh, it's going to, there we go. Okay, so the one that you're looking at most often. Um, is this one right here. That's what it, most of them look like, and I'll show you one in class, um, what it looks like, but it is measuring the changes in pressure. So um, as we have pressure increasing um, from day to day or d throughout the day, if we measure the air pressure in the morning and we take it again in the afternoon and we notice that it's rising, that means that there is a high pressure system coming our way, and that means we can expect good weather 
coming our way very soon. But just the opposite, if we see in the morning, if we take our, um, if we take a reading from our barometer, and then the afternoon we look at it, and we notice that it is dropping, that means a low pressure system is coming our way and bad weather. Okay, low pressure systems are always associated with bad weather, and you can probably always find a front right near a low pressure system. Okay, we're gonna look at that when we look at our weather maps in a minute. The next tool we're going to talk about is a thermometer. The most main type that we talk about are the bulb type thermometers. Those are the ones that we're going to be using in class when we're doing our relative humidity lab. Um, they're pretty simple. Basically, there's a liquid in there, and as li the liquid heats up, it expands, and as the liquid cools down, it contracts. So th that's the one that we're going to see most often. We have a, there's a bimetallic type of thermometer, um, which is made up of two different types of metals. Um, and as the temperature changes, again, you have that expanding and contraction. So same idea as the liquid one. It's just made out of two different metals. And then the thermistor, which is the one that's coming up right now, um, those are the most commonly used today, and they change their resistance with changes in temperature. Okay. Moving on to psychrometers. That is going to help us measure the amount of humidity in the air. Um, this one that's right here is called a sling psychrometer. So the way that you um, measure humidity is that um, you can see it's this one right here says that this wick right here is wet. Um, and so you have a dry bulb and a wet bulb. And you take the sling psychrometer and you spin it round and around and around and around and around. And um, as the water starts to evaporate right here from where it's wet, it's going to drop the temperature. So just like um, your body sweats to cool itself off, right? Because when you sweat and that water, that sweat starts to evaporate from your skin, it actually cools your skin. So same idea. As the water is evaporating right here from this wet bulb temperature, it's going, the water's going to start to evaporate and it's going to stop, start to drop that temperature. When that temperature starts dropping, we're going to take the difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb, and then we're going to look at um, the current air temperature, and um, we'll be able to find our relative humidity. And we're going to be doing a lab just like that so you guys can get more practice with how that works. But um, psychrometers and hygrometers, they both measure um, relative, the amount of um, water vapor in the air, so humidity. An anemometer. Um, is a tool that um, measures wind speed and wind direction. So you can see right here, this little part right here, um, these little cup-like things, they spin around and around and around. They are very sensitive um, to the wind. They can measure the lightest breeze and they also stand up to hurricane force winds. And then this part up here is actually called a weather vane, but it's part of the anemometer. And it points the direction in which the wind is coming from. So same thing that we were talking about with how we name our winds, like the westerlies, they come from the west, the easterlies come from the east, and they blow west. Um, same thing, the weather vane points in the direction in which the um, winds are coming from. All right, we are going to move on to radar. There we go. Radar is an electronic instrument which determines the direction and distance of objects that reflect radio energy back to the radar site. So basically it's sending it out and then it's bouncing back and it's coming back. It is um, When we look at radar, um, it is going to show the strength and physical phase of water. Um, this picture down here is what radar looks like. Okay, So this is sending out, this thing right here is sending out radar signals. Um, to determine the distance of how far away are those clouds that are bringing rain um, and what is the strength of um, what's coming towards us. Okay, and then we have something called Doppler radar. I'm sure you guys have heard of Doppler radar. Um, you've probably seen on the Weather Channel it says something like, and the Doppler is showing us that um, this precipitation is very heavy and we're going to get this much amount. Um, etc. But um, so when we're talking about Doppler radar, 
Again, it's going to detect precipitation intensity. Is it raining a little bit or a lot? Wind direction and speed, and estimates of hail size and rainfall amount. So that's how they figure out, oh, we're going to have one to two inches of rain or snow. Um, it's going to give meteorologists and forecasters um, the ability to provide early detection of severe thunderstorms that might be, bring strong damaging winds, large hail, heavy rain, or tornadoes. Um, and combining this with satellite, it's going to give us a lot of good tools in order to make a good forecast. Okay, so here's where um, I was just talking about weather satellites. They're really cool. Um, there's two different types. They can be polar orbiting, which means they're going to orbit the Earth around the Earth two times. So they're going double the speed that Earth is rotating. So every 12 hours, they're going to go around the same spot. Um, and then there's another type that's called geostationary, which means that the satellite is orbiting at the same exact speed that Earth is rotating, so it's staying over the same spot all the time. So if the satellite is over top of the United States, it um, rotates with the Earth and stays over top of the United States, giving us um, data on what's happening over around the United States all the time. Okay? So a quick summary. Um, Weather instruments are important to us because they um, can reveal, I guess, the invisible factors like air pressure, like temperature, um, that help us predict the weather. And meteorologists, people who um, study weather patterns, not meteors, meteorologists study weather, they use measurements of temperature, air pressure, humidity, wind speed and direction, um, satellites and radar, all of those things to determine um, weather conditions. And then our satellites and radar show the movement of air masses, storms, and fronts. Moving on to weather maps. Objective 24, I can read and understand a weather map. The first thing, um, again, these are the symbols, and I talked to you about this a little bit ago when I was talking to you about fronts. Um, the important part here is that the symbols point in the direction that the front is moving towards right here. The symbols point in the direction that the front is moving towards. So if this warm front was on a weather map, it would be moving this way. This cold front would be moving this way. Stationary front, again, they don't move. And then an occluded front um, is where we are cut off, and the symbols are pointing the direction in which it is moving. That's very important to remember. Okay, so some of you asked about those black lines that I put on my weather foldable over my um, weather map. And they are called isobars, and they connect areas with equal air pressure. Um, so this is what we're talking about right here is a high-pressure area right here. It's reading 1,036 millibars. As we get away from the high-pressure system, our pressure is going to decrease. So this one, the next one, um, right here is at 1,032 and then we're out here we're at 1,020 and this whole area that this line right here connects is 1,020 and as we get out here it's 1,012 so as we go away from the high pressure system our, our pressures are getting lower okay same thing right here this high pressure system we're at 1,032 this line here represents 1,028, this one's 1,024, and the entire line represents the same pressure. So they connect areas of similar pressure, okay? All right, here is a weather map. First off, a couple things I just want to point out. First of all, this is a warm front. It is moving this way. Your symbols are pointing the direction in which it's moving. This cold front is moving this way. This cold front is moving this way. Here's a stationary front. Guess what? It's not moving at all. Okay? All right, here's a pretty good map that shows us um, a good example of our isobars. Again, here's a low pressure system right here. You can see right here it's 988. And I talked to you about a high pressure um, that as you move away from a high pressure that your um, pressure is going to decrease, but as you move away from a low pressure system, that's as low as it gets right there, as you go away from it, it's going to increase, okay? So right here, we're at 988, 
The next circle here, 996. This one's at 1,000. This one's at 1,004. This one's at 1,008. 1,012. 1,016. It goes all the way around. This is 1,020 over here. Okay, so those isobars are connecting areas of similar pressure. As you go away from the low pressure system, your um, pressure is going to increase. As you go away from a high pressure system, your pressure is going to decrease. All right, um, this probably looks very familiar to you um, as you watch um, the weather station to see what's happening. You a lot of times get these, um, these keys up here that tell you what's going on. I just want to point out, look at what your low pressure systems, okay? Around your low pressure systems, you have precipitation, okay? This light green, dark green means light rain. Um, to moderate rain right here, and then you have these yellow areas, which are areas of fog, okay? So every time you have some kind of low front or a um, low pressure system, you're going to have a front in that area. If you check out up here where this high pressure system is, we don't see any fog. We don't see any precipitation happening, okay? High pressure, good weather, low pressure, bad weather. Okay, here's just another example. Um... Again, here's your low pressure center. Oh, it moved on, but that's okay. We'll use this one instead. Okay, so here's our low pressure center. Here's another low pressure, low pressure, low pressure. You can see all of these fronts happening around here. Along with fronts, bring us precipitation. All Fronts always are bringing us precipitation, guys, because you have warm and cold air mixing, and when that happens, you get bad weather. Okay, here's a high pressure system over here. It's pretty clear. And as you're going away from your high pressure system, your pressure is getting lower. As you go away from a low pressure system, your pressure is getting higher. Okay? And that is all. Congratulations. I know this is a super long video. It's because I was reviewing. That's why I did guided notes for you guys again this week. But that is the last video of this first unit. You made it. You're successful in living in a flipped classroom. If you have any questions, please bring them to me. Let me know. If you have a question, someone else does too. All right, see you in class.